Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about the mysteries of the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. We're going to take a look at the Ark of the Covenant and find out how, why, and when it was built, and what happened to this mysterious sacred object. Today, we're Raiders of the Lost Ark. Back to the talk show. Good to be with you guys in the studio. Great topic, new developments, a lot of history, tradition, and beauty of our faith. And really. a touch on the Indiana Jones, clearly one of my favorite movies of all time. Mine too. Raiders of the Ark, man. That was just a phenomenal yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the Ark of the Covenant really has always been one of those objects that's been the most sought after historical and holy relics. Because um, the Ark of the Covenant is one of the most major things that's completely lost and vanished mysteriously. And there's so many theories. And today we're going to get into, you know, where did the Ark go? Is it in Ethiopia? Is it still in Jerusalem? Is it in Rome? Is it, uh, you know, where's it at? So we're going to get into all those theories today and teach you a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant too. Mm -hmm. And its place also not just in, you know, quasi-pseudoscience and, and all this, you know, kind of theory stuff. We're going to talk about its place in you know, in religion, in the Catholic faith as well. And its centrality to not only Judeo-Christian heritage, the theology of Christ, uh, God incarnate, all of this plays into something that's probably one of the most, I don't know, like important objects of our time mm -hmm. in, in all of history. And mm -hmm. one of the most important theological subjects, namely mercy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what this, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> now, we just want to take a moment before we jump into this show to just thank our patrons out there. Thank you for your support of the show. Without you, we would not be able to produce it. And for you viewing our content on YouTube, make sure that you hit the subscribe button, click the bell so that every time we produce a show, it will populate in your feed. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, on Twitter. We've got some really cool material out there. Be sure to share the show. And as we jump in, you know, I can't, I can't help but reference our, our show on, on the chalice, like the chalice of Christ, because it's kind of related. So make sure you check out that show as well. Yeah, good idea. So what is the Ark of the Covenant? Um, in the ancient world, there's a lot of times a thing called an Ark, right? And it would be carried around in, into battle or in a, king, a kingly procession, and it would contain important documents, important signs of a king's rule, Okay. So it was a pretty common, not really common, but it was a well-known thing that people did. So in the book of Exodus, when Moses is on Mount Sinai for 40 days getting the Ten Commandments, God also commands him to build specifically this ark. And now this ark was meant to hold in it the Ten Commandments themselves, the actual stone tablets. So I don't know if a lot of people even know what the Ark of the Covenant was, right, and how... They just think, oh, that's this powerful missing relic, but it was meant to contain the Ten Commandments. It contained a vial of the manna that fell from heaven. That's right. And then it also contained Aaron's priestly rod. So these kind of, these three elements, it's What's the, a rod, though? A rod. A rod. A rod. A rod. Mm -hmm. You know, so these three things really contained, I would say, examples of the kingship of Yahweh, of God, right? It's the food that he fed his people with the law that he gave, and the rod that he ruled with, right? And these are supernatural objects. They're, they're not objects that were created by man and then placed in this ark. They were actually supernatural objects, and that's a very important thing moving into the future as we discuss the ark and, and Christianity. Mm -hmm. So God gave Moses, I mean, straight up uh, directions, instructions on exactly how it was to be built. So the Ark of the Covenant was two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits, right? By one and a half cubits. So it's roughly four <clears throat> feet by two and a quarter feet, right? A cubit, by the way, is the length from your elbow to the tip of your finger. Oh, to the tip of the finger. So that's a, that's a cubit, right? Yeah. Mm. So that's, you know, everyone's arm's different, right? But that was essentially what a cubit was. So roughly four feet by two and a quarter feet it was made of acacia wood and lined with solid gold. Mm. Um, it had a lid, and the lid was called the mercy the seat. The mercy seat, yeah. And it had two gilded <clears throat> angels, um, cherubs, cherubs mm -hmm. yeah, 
facing each other. And this essentially was the throne of God. It contained the power of God. Um, so when you think about something like that, I mean, how can a, an artifact or a relic be more powerful than that, that it contains the law and God's presence itself? I mean, that's, I would say, only rival to the cross uh, as far as being, you know, that item that mm-hmm. is so integral to the faith. Mm-hmm. And, the, and when you think about the cross being the instrument of how Christ atoned for our sins, you know, the high priest would enter in to uh, the presence of the, the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement. So the tie of, of mercy as it relates to the mercy seat of God, as it relates to how mercy is administered to the congregation or the people, in the same way, I like the, I like the tie and to the cross because it's, it's that same type of delivery. Mercy is what bonds us, and mercy is our greatest attribute overcoming the battles of life. Now, it also tells uh, Scripture in Exodus, also tells who actually built it, right? It wasn't Moses himself who built it because Moses wasn't a you know craftsman. He couldn't do gilding and woodworking and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe he could, but he didn't in this instance. I don't want to impugn Moses' woodworking skill. Um, but it, the Bible specifically says that the person who built it was called Bezalel, and he had a assistant, Oholiab. Okay? So, the, I mean, the whole p- of Genesis and Exodus well, particularly Exodus, they have some very specific examples of what was supposed to be built for the Ark of the Covenant, what the, uh, all the instruments that go into the holy tent, that, you know, the tabernacles, everything. Uh, it can get even almost boring to read because it's so detailed. It's like a, yeah. it's like an Ikea instruction mm-hmm. at times, right? It's, <laughs> it gets pretty laborious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know what's, what's cool is like you go into some of the Catholic churches and you see a lot of that design around the tabernacles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I actually, I actually visited a retreat center for priests, and the tabernacle was for in adoration uh, in the adoration chapel next to the library. Um, it it was designed as the mercy seat of God, which was really a beautiful place of prayer. And this, mm-hmm. for those who don't know about the Ark of the Covenant, this is a great prefigurement into where we're going in this conversation. Mm-hmm. So what was the Ark of the Covenant used for? So after they stored these incredibly important elements and kind of signs of that covenant between God and his people, the Israelites carried it with them through the desert for the 40 years, and it was almost like a Hebrew weapon of mass destruction. Mm-hmm. This was yeah. their this was their source tank. of power. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you'll see time and time again in scripture where before they're going into battle, mm-hmm. Moses or or Joshua is using the Ark of the Covenant almost as the the tip of the spear of their formation, right? When they're going around um, Jericho, they take the Ark of the Covenant right. around. When they're, um, you know, whenever they're going into a battle, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant as kind of, number one, a power of, a sign of God's power, but also an actual implement. I mean, they, it would be said that the Ark would actually yield that power that would give them right. b- you know, victory the, in battle. The most important mm-hmm. thing, I think, to consider here is the faith, mm-hmm. the faith that they had in God through this. You know, I mean, the, the power exists, but the faith, I think, of the Jewish people during the times that they yielded mm-hmm. wielded this, you know, quote-unquote weapon mm-hmm. um, was a, a an instrument as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. It was like a confidence generator, you know, yeah. going into battle for yeah. sure. Now, it's funny that you say generator because there's some theories as to why the Ark was so uh, maybe kind of powerful. Like if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, when they open it up, all the Nazis' faces melt. And, you know, if anyone touches it, they die. Um, You even read in scripture there was was a guy named Uzzah. Mm -hmm. And he was actually – the Ark of the Covenant didn't go right from, you know, Joshua into the temple. There was no temple. So it was kind of moved around to different tents for hundreds of years after the time of Moses and Aaron. And uh, Uzzah was from one of the houses or one of the tents that was guarding the Ark of the Covenant, and David was bringing it to actually take it to another location, and the people carrying the Ark started to tip, and Uzzah was afraid that the Ark was going to fall over, so he put his hand up to touch it to keep it from falling over, and he died immediately. Well, I mean, you touch the Ark, you, you die, right? So there's some theories that some, you know, kind of fringe scientists will have that it was actually a kind of like a, an electrical device. Because mm-hmm. if you look at the way that the shape of the wings pointing towards each other and the way of its construction, where 
you have gold on the outside, then you have acacia wood, then gold on the inside, and then you have these two cherubs, They it almost becomes like a what's called a Leyden jar, which is like an ancient form of electricity, right? Of, of battery, essentially. So the outside going through the arid desert with all the static electricity would get a negative charge and the inside would have a positive charge. And if you touched it, it would release. And, you know, they say that you can build a device to those dimensions, positively charge it, and it has enough charge to be able to kill a person if you touch it. Wow. Mm. That's fascinating. Sounds like an episode on the ancient aliens. Uh, you know. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, but, but you know, like there was fear around the Ark of the Covenant when it came to the enemies of, of Israel, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, I think it would have to bear some type of, you know, powerful, uh, you know, charge for sure. You know, mm-hmm. but I also like the analogy of, of Uzzah touching it and dying it. And dying, when you think of how pure that the law had to be, it's also the same kind of parallel with with Our Lady, where she was also pure and untouchable too. Mm-hmm. She, you know, to be the bearer of that new covenant, she was inviolable, right? Yeah. Just like the Ark of the Covenant the Ark was of the new covenant, right? And you'll mm-hmm. hear Mary referred to a lot of times as the Ark of the New Covenant because listen, she listen carried to this. That this in is her. to that point. Saint Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, is credited with writing about the connections between the Ark and the Virgin Mary. Quote, O noble virgin, truly you are greater than any other greatness, for who is your equal in greatness? O dwelling place of God, the Word, to whom among all creatures shall I compare you, O virgin. You are greater than them all, O Ark of the Covenant. Clothed with purity instead of gold, you are the Ark in which is found the golden vessel containing the true manna. This is the flesh in which divinity resides, end quote. Homily of the Papyrus oh, of Turin. I mean, that's just absolutely well, beautiful. Athanasius is amazing, but that's all, that's awesome. Yeah, it really is. And it's exactly what you were touching on at all those little points uh, in respect to her purity mm-hmm. and, and uh, the Ark. So, like I said, the Ark moved around for hundreds of years, mm-hmm. and then finally it was placed in the Temple of Solomon, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the Temple of Solomon was built for that, and it was the focal point of... Worship. Jewish worship, yeah. right? This was the Holy of Holies was the sanctuary where this was placed. Now, even today, we call the, the altar the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. So even in our Catholic worship 3,000 years later, you still see that sense of that uh, temple worship that, we did, that was developed at the time. <clears throat> um, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Dome of the Rock, the al Aska Mosque, right? Yeah. That used to be the Temple of Solomon. The foundation stone that's under the dome there, that is the specific spot where the Holy of Holy was. Mm-hmm. And on that rock, the foundation rock, where according to Muslim tradition, Mo, uh, what's his name? Muhammad, Muhammad. ascended, yeah. or according to Jewish tradition, Jay that's where ordered. earth was created, started from that point. And that's where God touched earth, essentially, to start the creation. But there's a, there's a cutout on that rock. Now, it's, you don't see a lot of pictures there because it's pretty protected. Yeah. But there's a cutout, and you can see this is very likely where directly the Ark of the Covenant would have been placed mm. and rested. Mm. That's fascinating. And to, and to realize that this has an immense amount of reverence in Islamic tradition as well as Christian tradition. Yeah. And, you know, we'll get into it in a little bit, but, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian roots of Ethiopian Jews and Ethiopian Christians, I think, has the strongest cultic respect and reverence for the Ark and has amazing amounts of, of uh, you know, renditions and, and remembrances of the Ark in, in their churches, wherever mm-hmm. you go. Mm-hmm. So after being the obvious and the center point of, of worship, I mean, Jews only had one temple. They didn't have churches in every corner. They didn't have, you know, St. Hezekiah's and St. Uzziah's. Yeah. And, you know, they had the temple. That was it. You know, yeah. it's like us having one church. Yeah. And they all went to it, right? Um, so that was there. And then... Kind of mysteriously, the ark, after being the most important thing and what all focus of worship was oriented towards, disappears from the record. And you just don't hear about it anymore. When was that? So you're not really sure. No one's really sure because it's never mentioned. It just kind of stopped being talked about. Now, there's a couple theories, and that's really where we start to get into where did it go because... When did it leave really dictates where it probably but went. But such an important thing, you think it would be documented. So it's just kind of a mysterious thing that 
we don't have records of that. No, there's some yeah. records, but they're conflicting, right? So <clears throat> there's two probably most likely events that led to the Ark of the Covenant being lost. Um, the first would have been the Babylonian destruction of Judah, yeah. right, and of Jerusalem in the siege of 586. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar completely destroyed Jerusalem, burnt down the temple, uh, expelled all the people and took them into captivity. But it specifically never said that it was taken. And you would think that, look, this city is being under siege. It's not like you come in. You'd hide it. You'd hide it. I mean, the city was under siege for a year, right? Yeah. You're going to hide that if you know the day is coming. Just well, you'd like, have a plan to hide it. Right. Just like when the Hagia Sophia fell, there's a plan to take the great altar yeah. and all that stuff. I mean, this was there. So that's the, one of the most likely course, cases of when it disappeared. The other one, I think, is probably, to me, more likely. So King Hezekiah was probably, you know, maybe the greatest of the... Jewish kings of the southern Judah kingdom. And he's the one who really, he's like, you know, he found the book of law. He re kind of oriented worship towards Yahweh alone. Before that, they kind of felt, you know, fell into polytheism mm -hmm. again. And Hellenism and, yeah. and the influences of Greece. Yep. And he kicked all of that out. And, you know, and he's a king that we have actual historical records of. I mean, he's in Assyrian records, so, you know, Hezekiah of Judah, right? This is no debate that he existed. Mm -hmm. And in reinstituting all of this, he made it very monotheistic and very focused on the Ark of the Covenant again. He's kind of like, you know, Pope Benedict, right? He's yeah, like making gotta, it, you know. We got to get back. We got to get back. He's restoring traditions, yeah. right? Where you had the kings before him were kind of your Vatican twos. Yeah. This was your traddy guy, right? For analogy. Mm. That's a, that is a weak uh, analogy, but we I can keep so on moving. We'll yeah. leave it. Okay. So... <laughs> His son, though, total boomer, right? I mean, he was all about <laughs> felt banners and, you know, he was... He, We're like, continuing with analogies. Yeah, so his son, his, pre his predecessor, or I'm sorry, his successor was King Manasseh. And, you know, he's cruising around, tambourines, king of glory comes, right? The whole thing, right? And he reinstitutes polytheism. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, we only have one temple, right? All of a sudden, right at this time period you see the only other ancient temple of Jews in the entire world being built. And that was on Elephantine Island in the Nile in Egypt. Hmm. Okay? So the correlation where, like, everyone's like, okay. Yeah. We had this really strong revival, we're really into religion, and all of a sudden, baby boomer Manasseh comes in and just absolutely junks the place up. So the theory is that they kind of took off with it because they were... They're like, we're not leaving the Ark here with your polytheism. It took it to Elephantine Island in Egypt. Before the siege? Before the siege. Yeah. So this would have happened around 701 yeah. or 690, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere in B.C. Which would be a, a holier way of looking at the protection of the Ark. Right. So maybe they weren't, maybe the Ark of the Covenant dis didn't disappear because of the Babylonian captivity, but because of basically bad religious practice and the priests of the temple said, we're mm -hmm. out of here and we're taking our ark with us. It's, mm -hmm. it's entirely possible. Because why would there be another temple? A temple only existed in Judaism. And there's a 3,000-year-old temple in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the only other active Jewish temple in the ancient world, mm -hmm. and it's there. And w what about the Mount Nebo or Nebo uh, one, too? I mean, it's there's, there's in 2 Maccabees, uh, written around 100 BC, says the prophet Jeremiah, being warned by God before the Babylonian invasion, took the Ark of the Tabernacle and the Altar of Incense and buried them in a cave on Mount Nebo, informing those of his followers who wished to find the place that it should remain unknown until the time that God should gather his people again together and receive them unto mercy. So there's a precedence. Mm -hmm. Well, I know this is this is the, one of the main theories, and this is the one that I think is probably most likely. This is yeah, this is this is very very interesting. That's one, that's one thousand or one hundred BC. One hundred BC. To, it was written. Yeah. 1, well, no, so the was, Maccabees it was happened, written. Pro, yeah, it in one hundred BC, but they were talking about prior. Jeremiah, who would have been okay. back then. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so Egypt, we either got a Mount cave, Nebo, or we got a, a mountain. Now, here's an interesting Mount Nebo is the place where Moses went up to, where God said go to the top of the mountain and look over the Holy Land because you're never going to see it, right? Yeah.
that was mountain. Well, that's interesting. So tie it's, there. there's kind of an interesting tie where mm-hmm. it's this holy mountain of waiting, mm-hmm. right? Where Moses had to wait. He couldn't go into the Holy Land. The people weren't worthy of the ark anymore. They had to go there and wait. I mm-hmm. think that's... I think Mebo means waiting too in Hebrew. Really? I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, just when I thought you added something to the show, you <laughs> run and take it away. Um, but, you know, the the book of Ezra says, no, it was, you know, taken off to Babylonia, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, third book of Ezra. It was like pillaged? Yeah. yeah. So there's kind of conflicting things. Now, Ezra mm-hmm. is apocryphal. It's, you know, it's... Right. Not, or, you know, with the, with the Babylonian, uh, you know, invasion... You could also you could also argue you know they had such confidence around the ark that they would be protected, and you know something. That's what would I'm thinking too. And and it could have been you know. Well, I mean, if you look at like the the true cross, mm-hmm. right? right? You know, we were, we were taking that into battle to fight, you know, the Saracens, and we lost, and mm-hmm. they took the cross and dragged it through the streets of Damascus. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's also likely, too, that they didn't hide it because they're like, if we hide it, we're definitely screwed, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So in that case, then it probably would have been taken because in the mm-hmm. ancient world, you took other people's gods and oh, you put yeah. them in your temple and were like, I just, uh-huh. I stole mm-hmm. your gods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I got your nose and your god. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got this sort of this standoff here in terms of where this mm-hmm. this arc is. Now there's some other point. there's some other theories that I think are pretty <clears throat> worth uh, exploring. Um, you mentioned Ethiopia. Yeah. Now this one's got a lot of press. You'll read a lot about it. I don't think it's very likely. Mm-hmm. Sorry to the, my Ethiopian brothers because they they really focus like their it. worship on the ark. Absolutely. It's in every single Ethiopian Orthodox <laughs> Tewahedo church. Yeah, where they every have a replica church. of the ark. Every single church. Why would they have that? Has a replica. And and that's and, the thing. As Christians at that time, mm-hmm. too. Well, and this is now. This, this is right now. now. No. No, but what I'm saying is the heritage, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. the, the the tradition of that apostolic work, mm-hmm. right? So that tradition, or according to the Ethiopian tradition, comes from, you've heard of the Queen of Sheba, right? Mm-hmm. No one really knows where Sheba was. Who was the queen of Sheba? Where Sheba? Well, Ethiopia, according to Ethiopians, and she went up famously in the Bible and met King David. Well, according to this tradition, they had a kid, right? Because it was pretty common for kings to have kids with other rulers to kind of consolidate power. So they had the kid, and the kid goes back to Ethiopia with Sheba, and then when he gets old enough, the queen sends him to David to learn, to be educated, and maybe be the successor. And um, for some reason or another, I don't really know the exact thing, but she, the kid leaves and takes the Ark of the Covenant with him back to Ethiopia. And that's the origin of that. On David's watch? On David's watch. David knew about it. Now, that's nah, the origin of man. it. No. Nah. I agree. No. Nah. <laughs> I think it's nah. Solomon. It's Solomon's, not David. Solomon, you're yeah. right. I'm sorry. Solomon, I could believe. Because <laughs> <laughs> Solomon had... But David's not going to take over without pursuing the ark. So well, I, I just don't think that... I don't know, man. Not the same... Not The same. Uh, the wisdom of Solomon? Guy. He's just going to let his son cheese off with the ark of the covenant and the power of God? Now, here's the interesting thing about the cheese off <laughs> with the Ethiopian one. Now, I mentioned earlier that temple in the Nile River. Mm-hmm. Where's the Nile River go after it leaves Egypt? The Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. Well, you, yeah, even if you're taking it out that way. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it goes Ryan two ways. Been outsmarted by Ryan Del- Everybody take note. All right. <laughs> So that that temple on Elephantine <laughs> Island was destroyed. So the other theory is that those Jewish priests went down with it further down the Nile to Ethiopia. And it's pretty interesting if you look at Ethiopian genetics, they have genetic markers that say that they are Jewish. Yeah. Which they're the only course. population of Jews, native black African Jews yep. in Africa in the world. Yep. So, that, I mean, that's... I don't buy the whole his son left with it, but maybe that contingency of right. monks could have got it there. Could have taken it there. That, yeah. and then they kind of had to explain, well, why are these monks or these priests? And you bringing would want to move it very far at that point as right. well. Like you, you want know? to get it away from Manasseh, who's <clears throat> you know tearing down the altars and everything, right? right. 
Interesting you say that, Ryan, because there's another legend that, that says that the Ark was taken off even further uh, into South Africa by the Lemba people, and Zimbabwe have claimed that their ancestors carried the Ark south, calling it the, I'm going to butcher this, but Noma Lungundu, or Voice of God, eventually hiding in a deep cave in the mountains there, in the uh, Dumge Mountains, their spiritual home. So there's, again, like all throughout Africa— there's just a ton of, um, you know, different people that have claimed that they have the ark, um, even in Arabia and like there's so many other places that have claimed that they are the ones who carried off the ark and but they and they have that culture also, around it. It could also be also a progression too of cultures or, you know, because all these um, it just keeps cultures going. were embattled, right? And so you could see them passing it on, moving it. I mean, that's ultimately the the theme of this is that in battle where the safety is not there, they're moving it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, hey, this culture is passing it on. No, it's not the case. It's Mm going to be the threat. Where is it safe? There's a threat. Yeah. You know? And everybody's going to know that threat no matter where they are because of these victories that have been won. So it would be good to look at, like, those battles or those conflicts and – follow that to see if that's in fact where it went um Mm -hmm. you know so so you know i've also read that the lemba people have some of the same genetic traits that um that those jews or those ethiopian jews have so there's even some kind of genetic credence to that 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 might be a possibility you know that's that's really interesting because as you as you kind of figure out and this is what i like about what delacross is saying too is if you follow these kind of pathways, like I feel like Indiana Jones, like kind of it's got searching. that red, that red yeah, line. It you know? does, man. Like you're just kind of following it. You I know feel like I'm searching. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm searching right now, man. Yeah, you look like it, yeah, man. Hey. So that's one of the kind of predominant theories you'll read is the kind of out through Africa along the Nile thread of theories. Um, going back to Hezekiah. Okay, this is kind of the, the next chain of theories. We got to bring it back. We got to bring it back. Yeah. Back to Hezekiah. It always goes yeah. back to Hezekiah. You got to. You got to. Yeah. Bring it back. Hezekiah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. We need a t-shirt that says that. Bring it back. Bring it back Hezekiah. to Hezekiah. Well, he- Hezekiah did bring it back. He yeah. brought back the true faith. <laughs> that's, right. so that's why we got to bring it back. Hezekiah yeah. is my boy, right? Yeah. So Hezekiah built a lot of tunnels under Jerusalem, right? Because the, they were constantly under siege, right? For the Assyrians and Sennacherib and um, uh, Sargon, right? They were constantly under attack because they were right between Egypt and Assyria who were trying to, they were like the USSR and the USA of the time. Right. They were always trying to get these little smaller kingdoms under their influence. Um, so Israel has, Jerusalem has no water, right? It's very little water. In your middle of the desert, if you don't have water, you'll die. So Hezekiah, anticipating that they were going to be put under siege, built all these pathways underneath the Temple Mount to the Gihon Spring to bring water in so it's inside the walls so that they would have water in case of a siege. Hmm. Now, a lot of the I've theories— climbed through, I've climbed through that, those literal wow. channels. Really? Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. So a lot of the theories say, well, that's the obvious place that you would look for because these were used as escape routes right. during sieges. Yeah. Um, they would well, create a compartment there and right. lock it up and Absolutely. You know, all sorts of secret stuff you could do down there. So that being the theory, that that's where it went. It didn't go to Babylonia. It didn't go— down the Nile, it stayed right under the Temple Mount. Now, from where there, where does it go? Because the Temple Mount was destroyed, 586, and it's been rebuilt and all this. Again. So who yeah. would have found it underneath there? Well, there's a couple options, right? It could have been the returning priestly class uh, when they're coming back from the Babylonian t- captivity, but when they come back, you don't hear about the Ark anymore. If the, if the priests were coming back and saying, hey, we're back, we got our new temple, yeah, it'd be Cyrus. Yeah, Old Testament. Yeah, the Cyrus yeah. helped us build a new temple. Well, hey, by the way, we, let's take out the ark from storage. Yeah. Didn't happen. It's gone. So I doubt that that actually happened. Um, so the couple theories are, there's two main theories. One, um, the next time the temple was destroyed was by the Romans. And the Romans completely destroyed the temple, and they rebuilt a, temper, a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. So during those excavations, 
they would have found that. And you'll see in some of these arcs in Rome, you'll see them carrying tables, you'll see them carrying, um, you know, what's the uh, candelabras, you'll see them carrying all the Jewish stuff from their war, I think it was uh, uh, the Emperor Titus, I think. It was before the Maccabean Revolt. <clears throat> after. 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 Okay. after. This was during the, um, um, the Bar Kokhba Revolt. Okay. So you'll see in Rome, on Roman structures, like, hey, look, here's all, her, with all yeah. the Jewish spoils. Showing it all. So they could have gotten it then, right? They could have destroyed the temple, take all the stuff from there as they're rebuilding the new one. They found this one. They're like, hey, just more gold stuff. Cool, take it back to Rome. You'll have some very early second century Jewish rabbis saying, I saw the Ark of the Covenant in Rome, mm. right? And mm. they say it was covered in blood. And they asked, why is it covered in blood? Well, that was the blood sacrifices spread. And they're like, because they were kind of mm. now removed from... Ark worship, arc centered worship. They didn't even know how it was used. So there's some of that. And basing on that theory, it stayed in Rome. And um, in the 12th century, St. John Lateran. Now, you know, the Lateran is the mother church. It's, it's the mother church of Rome. It's the mother church of the world. The world, yeah. I mean, well, Rome is the. But Vatican is not even the Pope's church. It's right. John Lateran. Mm -hmm. right. And in some documents in the 12th century, the canons of the church claimed to have the Ark of the Covenant. Really? They absolutely did. And Do you know anything about this, Rich? You know, I, I've got to say, you know, with all of these uh, thoughts and, and kind of narrowing in, all these people making claim that they have the Ark, I really want to, you know, shift the Inquisition this day to Ryan Shield, and I want you to put on the Indiana Jones hat. If you were Indiana Jones, where are we going to go discover the Ark? Where are we going to search for the Ark? Where are we going to put in the money? I agree. But but first of all, to all of our listeners out there, if you are searching, there's one app that I would highly recommend. It's Hallow. Hallow is one of our sponsors. And I'm telling you right now, I never knew I had a hunger like I did until I flipped on that app and I used the Daily Reflections and Lexio Divino came into my soul, and I connected with God in ways that I've never before connected with God through prayer. And it's all guided meditations. There's a lot more in there. I don't use a lot of it, but there's a lot more in there. That there's so much in there that you haven't even found everything that's in there. I mean, right. you might be swiping through one day, but <laughs> there's the Ark of the Covenant, right? That's how much is in hollow. That's a possibility. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how much information and features they put into this app. So, you know, Alessandro over there, guys. Alex. Alex. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, you built the Ark of the Covenant well, holder. I mean, right. I mean, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? But there's one way to find out. So by going to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can get it free. So you could poke around at it. You could put on your Indiana Jones hat, and you can go exploring in hollow and find all the great features they have. Lexio Divina, uh, sleep aids, uh, daily readings. Chant. Chants. Chants. Mike Schmidt's Bible minute, in the they year. They got minute prayers. Like if you got one minute in the day, boom, you boom, got something. Minute of prayer happens. Yeah. bam, right it's, there. It's 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 like it's like your conscience that tells you that you need to pray, but it's in an app and you just hit play and you're just like, yeah. Well, the beauty of Hallow is the fact that it accesses tradition in the Catholic life from the very beginning, from Scripture all the way through to present day. Mm -hmm. And you know what that reminds me of? What's that? My alma mater. Really? Ave Maria University definitely is rooted in Catholic tradition from the very basis of scriptural doctrine and teachings and fidelity and orthodoxy to the Holy See and the magisterial teachings of the church. Their motto, Veritati Splendor, meaning the splendor of truth, they live out in a complete way, not only in academics, but the way of life of the university, the town, the people, the students is just absolutely incredible. The way that people put into practice the very values that are rooted in scripture and tradition. So what you're saying is if you're searching. If you're searching and you find yourself with an Indiana Jones hat on your head, search no longer because I have the university for you. That's right. And it's the greatest if Catholic university. If you're searching university. for a university... 
Ave Maria. That's so go right. to AveMaria.edu. There you'll see over 40 majors that you can, you know. You know, one of the things is that they help you find something very important. Now, it's not the Ark of the Covenant unless Tom Monahan did something I didn't know. And then when he built Ave Maria the University. The real Ark of the Covenant the reason is on they the built property of Ave, Ave Maria. Ma the reason they built Ave Maria, Florida, the right. city, is as a cover. That's, that's right. The, that's the new, like, Helicarnassus. That's the new place the where they... The Ark of the Covenant. It's underneath Our Lady. there. Maybe it is. There it is. Maybe it is. Tom you Monahan said was, South Florida. I mean, Tom Monahan is a pretty impressive dude. He really is. And maybe that was one of those he things. He pulled it off. He pulled off a lot of things. We don't know. You know? Yeah, we, don't know. I, I we don't know. I mean, I he's, he's a very blessed guy. Now, what you can find there is your vocation. Now, I know you found your vocation there and you were wearing the collar. A lot of people think vocation only means that you become a priest or a nun. That's not true. Your vocation huh. is what you're called to be. That comes from the Latin word vocare. So you're going to find what you were meant to be at Ave Maria University through their faculty, the staff, the programs they offer, the support of the community, and so much more. Yeah. So again, go to avemaria.edu, find out more about how if you or someone you know is looking for an amazing Catholic college that supports your vocation and gives you real tools for success in the modern world, Go there. And I've, I've got to say, you know, Ave Maria was the golden years of my academic formation. And socially, I developed friendships that have lasted a lifetime. So if you know any kids out there that are searching for a university, have them search no longer. Check out AveMaria.edu today. All right. Speaking of searching, I've got my Indiana Jones hat on. Okay. And I think we've, we, we kind of stopped there uh, to talk about our awesome sponsors. But I think we're... we're, we're Kind of getting to the end of this show, or where, where are we going to look for this art? And that is the point because Ryan Shield must put on the yeah, Indiana, Indiana Jones, Jones hat. hat and answer the Inquisition for the day. Okay, what's the Inquisition? Hmm. The Inquisition is if Ryan Shield were to sink all of his wealth and inheritance and money and properties and everything, give up everything in pursuit of the ark. Where do we start? Well, let's think here. We have the Knights Templar theory where they found it in the waterways and those passages underneath Temple Mountain. That's why... Where would it go from there? That's where they would have gotten so popular and so, you know, powerful. From Then from there, they would have taken it to Shark Cathedral. I mean, even in Shark Cathedral today, you'll see some of the pillars have the Ark of the Covenant. Is there a shark in there? there no, shart. Oh, sh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shark Cathedral. Did you say shart? Yes. Okay. It's a place, Ryan. It's a place. Look it up. <laughs> Ryan knows it very well. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so from there, look, I mean, you're pretty rich, powerful, and then you know you're about to get, you know, wiped out by King Philip the Fair, I think it was. Oh, like, the same thing like the, the, the people in Jerusalem would have done. You I don't it. like this one. Now, that's one of the theories. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think God would put an Ark of the Covenant in the Shark Cathedral. <laughs> shark Cathedral is a beautiful... I don't think he put it there. He would have looked there. He would have looked there. Nobody would look there. <laughs> I'm going to start calling where I put Sun Cathedral. Oh. Oh. What, what else we got? Okay, so he, let's look at the contenders. We got Ethiopia. <laughs> I don't think so. We have Rome. I don't think no. so. They would have made a bigger deal about mm -hmm. it. And we would have had probably some writing about it. Yeah. The Knights Templar finding it and taking it to France, possibly, but I don't think so because if the Knights Templar found it, they would have had, they would have taken it like to Ethiopia. Or, so we've just I don't think over he, that I think Ethiopia is unlikely. It was moved. I think the two most the two most likely are is that that it went to Elephantine Island in Egypt, or and then from there places unknown or. Mount Nebo, or the, Mount I, Nebo I think I sense. think either that. I think the most likely is it's still buried under the Temple Mount. That's if I yeah. had to put my money. That's yeah. the place where I would still look. I think I think that and or Mount Nebo. Like and I think excavating there is not is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Mm -mm. No, that's it's not going to happen. happen. Mm -mm. So um, that might be why we don't have it. Right. You know, what do you think, Rich? Well, one thing you all ought to have is a subscription to this channel. That's right. Because, yes. let's face it. We're all searching. Look, it's no Shark Cathedral, but it's pretty good. It's, it's pretty worth subscribing awesome. to. It's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. So this was a blast. What a great episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed it. Father Rich, Father Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones. We will see you Short. next week. I'll see you in hell, Kalima. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>